How are we doing this morning? If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Genesis 37. Glad you're here, whether in person or joining us online as we continue our series on the life of Joseph. In 1971, uh, Corey Tinboom released an autobiography called The Hiding Place, which was a story of how her family ended up in multiple concentration camps because they helped hide Jews during World War II. And the way that she was caught is that she was actually set up by a spy to actually help somebody. And by helping that person, her family ended up being being caught, and they spent a lot of time in, uh, in, in these camps. In fact, I think her and her sister spent time in about four different camps, and what's unique about the hiding place is, is the story she gives about the courage of her sister, because no matter what was happening in the concentration camps, her, her sister was constantly talking about her hope in the Lord and was constantly speaking kind to everyone around them. In the lowest of lows, she was kind. And in the lowest of lows, she was talking about the hope that she had in the Lord. Our question for this morning is this, is in your lowest moments, what hope do you have? In your lowest moments, what, what hope do you have? And if I'm Corey Tenboom, I'm probably leaning over to my sister and saying, can we stop talking about hope in the Lord? I mean, he could have stopped us from getting here, and he did nothing, right? That's called being human. How would you define the lowest of lows based on personal life experience for you? You see, I think the lowest of lows are, are situations where we find ourselves in the absolutely worst positions ever, most miserable, uncomfortable places that we could be. I think some of us could give testimony and say in our experience, it often is a place that seems unfair or it seems that it's absolutely uncalled for. Maybe you've experienced the loss of a job or broken relationships or a failed marriage, hurt reputation, the loss of influence, the loss of position, a bad health report, surprising loss of a loved one. And the list can go on and on of how we can experience the low of the lows. Isn't it true, if life was up to us, we would love to live in the highs all the time, right? I don't know about you, I've never complained when life is going great. For some reason, I complain a lot when it's not going how I absolutely want it to go. Because when it's in the lows, when life is hard, I feel defeated, I, I feel crushed. And to be honest, there's times when despair can actually set in because it feels like hope isn't even an option. Ever been there before? In the low of the low? Today we're gonna pick up the story in Genesis 37 with the character of Joseph. And Joseph's been flying really high. Life's been really good for him. His dad, his name is Jacob. He's also known as Israel. And his dad loves jo Joseph more than he loves any of the other 12 kids. And not only does he believe that in his heart that he loves them more, he, he actually made a public declaration of his, of his love of Joseph over all the other siblings by giving Joseph an, a, a really elaborate coat, a, a coat or robe of, of many colors we talked about last week. And this robe, I mean, it, it demonstrated status and it demonstrated privilege that Joseph has over every other sibling in his life. And if you remember the story last week, God actually was involved in Joseph's life. God gave Joseph two different dreams and in both of those dreams, it confirmed the status that the coat was going to bring, that he would not only receive the family inheritance over all his siblings, but his siblings and his own parents were going to bow down to him one day. What a story. What a dream. Those dreams are going to seem like distant memories today. Ever experienced that in your life? You have a dream, you have a vision, and something happens and it robs it all? That's today in the life of Joseph. Let's pick it up in Genesis 37 and just kind of set the scene a little bit here. 
We'll start in verse 12. And it says this, Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to them, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent them from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers. And he said, Tell me, please, where they're pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone away. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them at Dothan. So let's just look at these few verses to understand the tension that's actually building here in the life of Joseph. Joseph's brothers are shepherds, just like Joseph at one point, and they went to Shechem to take care of their flock. Question, why would they go to Shechem? What happened the last time they were in Shechem? Do you remember? In Genesis 34, their sister was raped, and they carried out mass genocide in Shechem, killing every single man that existed there. I would be like, I'm not going to Shechem again, maybe. But here in the story, what does is, what is Jacob tell Joseph to do? I want you to go and, and check on the brothers and, and bring back a report. Now, now, here's the thing. We saw last week that, that Joseph brought back a bad report on his brothers. And so by bringing this report, here's what Joseph didn't do. He didn't look out the kitchen window to see how the brothers are doing. He didn't wander the family farm to see how the brothers are doing. He literally had to travel 50 miles to check on his brothers. It was a five-day journey north to actually get to Shechem. What a journey. Question, what's Joseph doing while all the brothers are out working the fields and taking care of the animals? You see, they're, they're shepherds, right? It's not a great life. They're grinding, they're sleeping with pillows being rocks. They don't have hot showers. Like, what, what, what a life of a shepherd being that far away from home. Joseph was sleeping in every day. Joseph was hanging out with daddy and all the mommies. Joseph was watching ESPN reruns all day. Right? Question, what, why would Jacob tell Joseph to to go check on the brothers? Why would he think that's a good idea? I just want to say, Jacob, have you seen the tension that exists between Joseph and your other sons? And you're going to send Joseph 50 miles away to check on the brothers who actually hate him? Why do you think that would actually be a good plan, a good idea? You see, Joseph seems to be safe when daddy's around. How do you think the brothers are going to respond? He starts heading away from home. He gets to Shechem, where he thought the brothers were going to be. And they're not there. And this random man saw him. (laughs) Literally, it says this man saw him and says, oh, your brothers aren't here. I heard them say they were going to go to Dothan. Well, Dothan's 14 miles north. So he's a whole nother day journey away from home to actually find his brothers. And so everything seems okay, though. He's got his coat on. He's, he's got his status, his privilege that dad gave him. And he's traveling 60 miles away from home. So as a reader, I think we're supposed to tense or experience the tension that exists here of what do you think is going to happen to Joseph being 60 miles from home away from daddy's protection? Three options we're going to see this morning when you're in the lowest of lows. Three options. And the first is this. The first is there's no hope. There's no hope, right? There's no way out. Let's check out the story in verse 18. It says, they, speaking of the brothers, They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will will say the fierce animal has devoured him, and we'll see what will become of his Dream. So let's start in verse 18. It says this, the brothers, they, they like literally lifted up their eyes and they saw the shiny coat come in their way. They saw the, the boy of privilege and the boy of status and the one who's going to receive the family inheritance who doesn't work over the, over the brothers who are grinding every day for him to receive that actual inheritance. And notice what his sight caused in their hearts. It's anger. 
They're angry. And immediately they, they hated everything about Joseph. I mean, how could they miss him? He's the favorite. If you've ever had a hatred like this in your life, you know that it actually needs to be satisfied. And so what do they do? They conspired to kill him. No, notice the unity. Did you see it in the verse? They literally said together, let us kill him. Then we'll throw his body in a pit and then we'll just say an animal devoured him. Like they have the whole plan figured out. This is what happens when our sin goes unchecked. How many times in our life have we had sinful intentions in our hearts, but we never acted on that sinful intention because we never had an opportunity to do so? Notice, there's opportunity. This is attempted murder. This family is awesome, isn't it, by the way? You see, for there to be attempted murder, there has to be a motive. We hate him. There has to be an opportunity. We're 60 miles away from home. Check out what happens in verse 21. But when Reuben heard it, he's the oldest, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into the pit here in the wilderness. We do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. Hmm. Reuben. Verse 23 says, So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and they threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water. Why is Reuben helping him? Is Reuben helping him because Reuben's an, like an upstanding citizen? The, the answer is no. Reuben wants to gain a right standing with his father. Reuben's been, he's, he's been, he's wronged his dad. And what did he do? He slept with one of Jacob's wives. Okay. And so he's not in dad's good graces. And so he's thinking, maybe I can put myself in a good spot with dad again if I can protect his son and bring him back to him and restore him back to his father. He says, look at the unity again. He says, let us take his life, or let us not take his life and shed no blood. Here's the thing. This whole conversation with the brothers is happening before Joseph even arrives to them. Because when Joseph arrives, what happens? If you're with us last week, we saw this, that Joseph likes to talk a lot, right? He's one of those kids that I think needed to be punched in the face. I said that, all right? He's talking to his brothers about the dreams and how awesome he's going to be, and they're all going to bow to him. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be epic. Joseph arrives here, and there is no conversation, there's no secret family handshake. There's no fist bump. There's no, there's no little spank on the booty. Like there's nothing happening with the brothers. What do they do? It's the first thing they do is they, is they strip him of his robe. They strip him. The term used for, for that is the skinning of an animal. So we're supposed to take away that they actually assaulted their brother. They literally said, give us all that status. Give us all that privilege. Give us that inheritance. And they ripped it all off him. And what do they do? They threw him in a pit. The protection's gone. The privilege is gone. The status is gone. And how was the pit described? Did you catch it in verse 24? The pit was empty and there was no water in it. You see, the text wants us to see that Joseph has a few days of life left if he stays in this pit. There's a few more days. And then it's, it's all over for him. The only way Joseph gets out of the pit is if his brothers let him out of the pit. Hey, listen, the lowest of lows can often feel like a place where there's nothing. He has nothing in the pit. Think about the, the difference here. We, we have the favorite son who's, who's loved and has everything from daddy, and he's now on the bottom of a pit with nothing. He's lost everything his dad was giving him. The easy life, the status, the privilege, it's gone you see, I think oftentimes that the lows are when we lose everything and we have nothing. Ever been there before? When I did my church planning residency in 2015, 
we were sitting in a room all sharing our story. Now, my friend, I'm talking about my friend Curtis Allen, who's been here, right? And if you know Curtis, you know him and I are very different, okay? There's another guy in our group that grew up in Miami. And he had, he lived in a mansion. He had everything he ever wanted until the day that the FBI broke into his home and took everything away because his dad was a drug lord. When I read this, this is what I think about. Having everything and now being in the bottom of a pit, actually having nothing. It's a crazy story. Now, let me give you a little side note here. When you are in Christ and the world wants to strip everything away from your life, I just want you to know this. If you know Jesus, (laughs) they can't take anything from you. They can't take the status. They can't take the privilege. They can't take away the eternal gift that you'll have in Christ. But Joseph is in, a, is in a bad spot here. So check this out, though. While Joseph is in a lowly physical place, can we just make the argument that the brothers are in a bad spiritual place? Like all pits, they can all have different shapes and, and different sizes. And the difference between the pit that Joseph is in and the pit that the brothers are in is that, is that they dug their own grave. Even though they're not physically in a pit, spiritually, they're in a terrible place. And they're both stuck. Joseph, by contrast of his brothers, and the brothers are stuck in their sin. Here's the crazy part. What we see in the hearts of the brothers is this, is that in our sinful choices, God will graciously show us what we are capable of apart from him. It's ugly, isn't it? Ever been embarrassed before about what you've done? Maybe something you thought you'd never do, but man, that was in you, and then the opportunity presented itself, and and you took it. Our sin is ugly, if we can be honest. It's gross. It's embarrassing. This is what happens when sin gets its way, when it dictates your next stop. And let's be honest, we all have a sinful bent. We have our own addictions, our own selfishness. We're prideful. We want the glory, right? And all of our choices like that result in a crushing weight of guilt on our life. Hey, church, listen. Do you know that there's more grace in God than guilt in you? There's more grace in God than than there is guilt in you. The anger, the lust, the jealousy, the bitterness, the greed, we all carry it. And all it takes for us is the right opportunity for us to give birth to the fruit, and it will be very bitter. And so here Joseph is in a spot where it seems hope is gone and despair has set in. Three steps, or three options when you're in the lowest of lows. Here's the second It's a false hope that you are your way out. Look at verse 25 with me. Look at the first part. It says, they sat down. This is the brothers. They sat down to eat. They sat down to eat. What's the first thing that we typically try to do when hope is gone? The first thing we try to do is create hope. We attempt to to work our own way out of a pit. And so what do you think Joseph is doing in the pit while the brothers are eating on top? Do you think he's saying, hey, brothers, this is good times. This is a great joke. If you could get me out, like that would be, that would be awesome. You guys win. Fun times. Attempting, right? Do you think his posture changed as time went by? Do you, do you think he ever called them up by name with a little more desperation? Hey, hey Reuben! Hey, hey, Judah! Hey, Levi! Please! Help me! And the brothers in unity are just eating a meal together? While Joseph is weeping in the bottom of the pit, the brothers are actually eating. And in Genesis 42, verse 21, it actually tells us that Joseph begged his brothers for help. 
He pleaded with them, will you help me, please? And it says this in chapter 42, verse 21, that they saw his distress and they did nothing. How often do we try to create hope? Listen, if, you, um, if you're a Detroit Lions fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Been a Lions fan my whole life, right? And every year there's this talk of, this is the year that's going to be different. And then, and then if you're a Lions fan, only you know what this means, that you start drinking the blue Kool-Aid, right? Can we just talk some real data and stats right now? I'm a kind of a stats guy. I remember numbers. I, I remember every soccer game and the score I've played since seventh grade. It's weird, all right? Just in case you didn't know, the Detroit Lions haven't won a playoff game since 1991, so if you're 32 years or younger, it's never happened in your lifetime. Do you know the Lions haven't won the division since 1993? Do you know they haven't won a championship since 1957? Listen, my parents are senior citizens. They were three and four then. <laughs> 66 years ago. False hope. False hope. We do it every year. So maybe Justin's right. We should just become Bills fans. (laughs) Listen, false hope. You believing that you're the answer to getting yourself out of despair. And despair sets in when when, when the status is gone, the privilege is gone, the, the, the inheritance is gone, the dreams are gone. Listen, think about Joseph. What did God tell him? You're gonna rule over people. Where's Joseph right now? He's in the bottom of a pit. What does that mean? It means that all the dreams that God actually gave him that he's been holding on to have been shattered. And the reason Joseph can't get himself out of the pit is because Joseph didn't get himself into the pit. Listen, what do you do when God allows your dreams to be shattered? What do you do when you turn to God and God is the one who gave you the dream and yet he's the one who rips the dream away? That's Joseph. Hey, church, what if it's in our shattered dreams that God does his greatest work? Yeah. What if in the shattering, if we don't experience that, we'll never actually have the whole picture? What if God actually has to break us to remake us? What if he has to ruin you in order that he might do something greater in you? Because we all we feel and experience in the shattering is the pain, right? God, this is uncalled for. God, this is terrible. God, you could do better. And God's like, I am doing better. Just wait. An important part of our breaking is realizing this, that we cannot save ourselves. We can't do it. Three options. We're in the lowest of lows. Listen, here's the thing about Joseph being in this pit. Joseph is in this pit, and God is shattering his dreams because God's ordained for it to happen. Him having this experience, losing everything in this moment, God ordained for it to happen. And whatever God has ordained, it's going to happen. Here's the thing. Everything hard in your life has to have God's permission. And God has given permission for the brothers to do to Joseph what they're doing to him. And the result is what? Is that you and I will gain a better perspective. And so while God is responsible for giving the dream. And while God is responsible for sharing of the dream, God is also responsible for making that dream become reality. We know the whole story of Joseph. We know he's going to be ruling and reigning in Egypt. Joseph doesn't know that. 
So we're not moved by it in the same way. He's living life, and this is what's happening to him. But think about what happens when he's ruling in Egypt. He's going to have the whole picture. Three options and the lowest of lows. Here's the last. It's, there's a real hope that, that God is, is, is your way out. Look at verse 25 again with me. They sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead and their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, look at the unity again. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and, and, let, us, and, and let not our hand be upon him, so he is, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him, and the Midianite traders passed by. They drew Joseph up. They lifted him up out of the pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Let's go back to the scene. Joseph is in the pit. He's weeping and crying out for help. They're eating a meal. Totally great. Ignoring what Joseph is saying. And what happens? Just like when they lifted up their eyes and they saw Joseph coming, they lift up their gaze and they see this caravan of Ishmaelites coming. And Judah speaks up. And Judah says, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him. <laughs> I mean, he is flesh and blood. That way we can make a little money on him too. So here's what happens. Joseph, status, privilege, family inheritance, going to be a leader, Everyone's going to bow down to him, down to slave. That's now his, his status. That's the privilege, is, is everybody dictating in your life what you will do next. Can I be clear? God's sovereign presence is over every single character in the story. So let me highlight what I, what I mean by that. Let's just review what we know of the story. Let's take a moment to take in God's sovereign presence in Joseph's life because the same God who's got presence in Joseph's life is, is present in your life, okay? Think about this for a moment. Joseph needed to be sent by Jacob to go check on the brothers. God's sovereignty over Jacob to ask his son to go check on him. Joseph needed to meet the man in Shechem when he got there, this random man, this one man who saw where his brothers went. That man needed to be there to tell them that your brother's headed to Dothan. God's sovereign presence. The brothers actually needed to leave Shechem and needed to head to Dothan because if they don't head to Dothan, they'll never see the caravan that's actually headed to Egypt. God's sovereign presence presence. Reuben, man, Reuben, he's so crucial to the story. Remember the brothers said, let us conspire. Let us, let us kill him and we'll throw him into a pit. And what did Reuben say? No, 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 no. Let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in the pit. Listen, Reuben interjecting on behalf of his brother was the sovereignty of the Lord to keep Joseph from being killed. God's presence. Everything in the story is crucial. Joseph needs to be headed to Egypt. Where's the caravan headed? Look at it at the end of verse 25. On their way to carry it down to where? Egypt. God is sovereign over every detail and store, part of the story in Joseph's life. And the same is true for you. But here's the truth. Every pit is a reminder that God is sovereign and you are not. That you don't have control, but God absolutely does. And everything is intentional by the Lord. Everything in your life needs God's permission. And so what is God doing? God is using the pit. God's going to use slavery in Joseph's heart to prepare him to be the leader that he actually wants him to be to help save his people. You see, in Joseph, here's one thing we learn. That there are lessons that we need to learn when we feel despair that we cannot learn unless we're in those positions. That's Joseph. 
And if that's true, then we can ask and make this statement. What if God allows the pain to come into your life, not because God is mean, but because God is intentional? He's intentional. He uses everything at his disposal to shatter us, to reveal our constant need for him. And he's going to shatter you and then he's going to restore you. And guess what's going to happen again? He's going to shatter you in another way and he's going to restore you. And then he's going to break you down again. And he's going to restore you into something even greater. He's so committed to you. I said last week that Joseph had to make a clear decision to trust God no matter what. Have you made that decision? to trust God no matter what life throws at you because, because here's the thing. If you make that call, God's gonna stretch that trust like you'll never believe. He's gonna pull it apart. He's gonna grow your faith in him in a greater way. I often wonder in my life with, our, with the pain that my family's been through And I think about all the pain that's happened in this room. I often wonder, what blessing would we miss out on if we didn't experience what we've experienced? And maybe you're in a spot right now where you can't see the blessing. You you have a limited perspective. You have a limited perspective right now. But there's blessing in the suffering. And it might be in you. And it might be in your kids. It might be in your parents. It might be those watching you. Everybody gets to receive from your suffering. It's actually never just about you. And what does God want? God wants Joseph in Egypt. Why? Because God needs Joseph in leadership because a famine's going to come that's going to crush everybody. And Joseph being a wise leader is going to devise a plan ultimately to save people. He's got to get to Egypt. And so here's the tension. They sell him for 20 shekels of silver, the common fee for a slave. And Joseph then, or Joseph's on his way to Egypt. But what do the brothers have to do next? They have to figure out what to tell dad. They have a 60 mile journey to, to kind of figure it out on, on what to actually do. And I'm not going to spend time to, to read the whole thing, but, but here's what they decide to do. Hey, let's kill a goat. Let's take his coat. Let's dip it in the blood and then let's go back home. But listen, brothers, on the 60 mile journey, <coughs> when we get back, we have to sell this to dad. We have to have all sorts of emotion. We have to make this a really big spectacle, a a big deal. There's got to be a lot of drama tied to it. So can you hear it when they get back home? Oh, dad, something terrible has happened to Joseph. We we found his coat. There's blood on it. We we pray this is not his coat. We, We hope this is not his coat. Is this his coat? And Jacob, or jo, or Jacob is crushed. He says, this is my son's coat. Listen, the brothers kept this secret for 20 years. 20 years. They watched dad weep for days and months and years after. And they could have interjected at any point, And they said nothing. What secrets exist in your family? Can we also highlight that everything's come full circle back to Jacob? Remember Jacob's story? He deceives his own dad. And now now what's happening? His own sons are deceiving him. It's all the same. It's generational sin that we talked about last week, right? It's, It's coming back to actually bite him. Question, what did the brothers gain by doing what they did? Did they gain status from their dad? Nope. They gained love from their dad? Nope. Gained the inheritance from their dad? Nope. Here's what they said. Here's what they believe. To Joseph, I don't care if we lose as long as you lose. That's a bad place to be. So can we highlight again the importance of Jacob being the leader of this family and all the tension that exists comes back on him by playing favorites, 
The fruit of what we're seeing is his fault. Hey, hey man, how often do you think Jacob's been praying for crop failure in his family? Hey, God, I've been planting these seeds of favoritism and generational sin. Can you somehow produce something else than what I've actually planted? Can can you take these seeds I've planted and and produce something beautiful with it, not something bitter? Ever done that? Where's the good news in the story? Honestly, there is no good news. If you read the last verse, it says, Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold them in Egypt to Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. And so Joseph is, is actually now a slave. And I, and I think the details of the story are exactly as God wants us to see it because God wants us to see the bad news of what's happening in Joseph's life because if the bad news is not so bad, the good news can't look so good. And so it's our gospel takeaway this morning is that in your greatest despair, Jesus invades with the greatest hope. In your greatest despair, Jesus invades with the greatest hope. And so whatever you're experiencing in your life right now, just know this, that, that Jesus invades the lowest of lows. He, he's coming after you, right, in the shattering. He's with you. He's, he's present. He's never going to abandon you in that place. And you can think about the tension of the family. We, we have the tension of Joseph being thrown into a pit that wasn't his fault. And we have the tension of the brothers, the sin that's waging war in their hearts. And so you can be in one of those two places today, but know this, that, that God's invading the mess. No matter the lowest of low you face, Jesus invades and is actively at work. You see, this little story of Joseph is really about the big story of Jesus. Let me, let me highlight some comparisons for you between Jesus and Joseph. Both Jesus and Joseph were loved by their father. Both were chosen to be firstborn sons with inheritance. Both were sent to a land far away to save and rescue. Both are described as shepherds in the Bible. Both are are hated by their brothers. Both were, were sold for silver. Both were stripped of their clothing. Both were thrown into a pit. Jesus into a grave. You see, the difference between Joseph and Jesus is that God the Father, he stopped Joseph from being killed. He did not stop Jesus from being killed. And he knows this, that by Jesus dying, by being thrown into a pit and and into a grave and resurrecting out of it, and we see Joseph being put into a physical pit and he gets drawn out. He's being resurrected out of a shattered mess into something better, that that story is same, is true for you and I. You see, God knew that Jesus needed to die and he needed to rise again, which was the proof of the love and the hope that he's bringing into a broken world. So the question is this then for you, friends. Where do you place your hope? Right now, where are you placing your hope? I want us to see this amazing verse in Revelation 21, 14. Check this out. It says, this is referencing the new Jerusalem, right? The the city of heaven. It says that it has a great high wall with 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. Are you catching that? I want to say, wait, what? When I get to heaven and I walk down the gates that God has built, I'm going to walk by each and every name of the 12 sons of Israel? You mean I'm going to walk under the Reuben gate? Do you know what this guy did? 
I'm going to walk under the Levi and Simeon gate? Do you know what those guys did? We're going to walk under the Judah gate? Come back next week. Judah's a disaster. If you're ready for more, come back next week. It's one of the texts I tried to hand off to the other guys, and they all said no. (laughs) Think about what we're going to walk under and how we would describe those people. But here's what God is saying. Your brokenness, the size of it, the specifics of it, it doesn't matter. I'm going to invade it. I'm going to provide hope where there is no hope. This is the kind of God that we serve in our life. And because Jesus, again, was stripped, we never lose our status with him. Jesus took it all. Jesus is our hope. Church, where are you putting your hope today? And whatever you're facing right now, it could be the lowest of lows. It could be the worst time in your life. Where are you going to put your hope? Trust me, he'll never let you down. Let's trust him to the end. Let's pray. Jesus, I want to thank you for your love for us. I want to thank you, being, thank you for being for us. Thank you for your word. And Lord, I can look at the siblings of Joseph and, and the sin that exists in their hearts and in their lives and, and be done with them. I'm like, God, these people are terrible. Yet what you do is consistent, is that you redeem broken sinners, which I am one. So I want to pray, Lord, for those right now who are on the lowest of lows. Lord, I just want to pray that they'll sense your spirit. They'll know that you're for them, that you're with them. And that you have a plan to restore. To pick up the shattered pieces and do what only you can do. Praying to that end, Jesus. I also want to pray for those, Lord, who don't know you. Who don't have faith in you. And I pray, Lord, that today will be the day that they'll realize that that you are so good and that you alone are our hope and that they will place their hope in you. In your name, amen.